<clears throat> it's hard for us to imagine what it would have been like to have been there in Jerusalem on the day that Jesus was crucified. Um, if you were there, what would you be thinking? And I don't ask that question because crucifixions were unusual, they were usual practices, but the events leading up to this particular crucifixion were uh, something else altogether. This Galilean carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth, had found himself on the centre of three Roman crosses and surely there wouldn't have been a resident in all of Jerusalem who hadn't heard something of this guy and something of what was going on. And emotionally charged atmosphere that became even more tense as the other gospel writers record for us just at that point of day when the sun should be shining the brightest there was darkness over the city for three hours what would have what would it have been like to have been there crowds gathering around hearing uh, snippets and bits and pieces of the proceedings and wondering at the statements that were being said by the men on the different crosses, marvelling at the fact that the two men on the outside still had enough energy to join in with the mocking crowds towards the men in the middle, wondering about the statements of this guy in the middle saying things like, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. People would be familiar with the noises coming from the crosses, but this was altogether irregular. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. In what? <laughs> I mean... You get it, that under enough pain, it causes some delusion. And so people in the crowd thinking, well, another day, another deluded zealot. Others listening carefully to the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then people sort of uh, whispering to each other, he's calling Elijah, he's calling, don't, don't, don't leave yet. Let's wait and see what happens because really people had no idea what was going on here. The words, I am thirsty, yeah, they're not all that unusual for someone on a cross, but for someone to say, uh, woman, behold your son, and then say to another fellow, behold your mother, well, we've never heard anyone on a cross say that before. And then what did people in the crowd make of the very last cry and statement which put an end to all the other statements? That one word which would have pierced the darkness of the day and that one word which unfortunately for us in English is translated into three so it probably loses a bit of the punch, uh, that one word finished it is finished why would he say finished why shout finished uh, some may have said well because that's exactly what he was <laughs> finished others may have said perhaps the fatigue from all the cruelty and the mocking was just too much a trumped up trial a horrendous accusation, the cruelty of people who should have known better, and then with one final word, this uh, wearied, bruised, beaten man bowed his head and simply cried his last. Well, what was it? Was it a cry of defeat? At the time, nobody knew it. 
but it wasn't a cry of defeat. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was a cry of victory. A wonderful victory cry. And that's just what I want to focus on uh, this morning. Lots that we could say about it, um, and so I'll spend our time this morning thinking about this. When Jesus says, it is finished, uh, what's he talking about here? It was the cry of victory which announced he had now fully completed all the work that he came to earth to do. A life of perfect obedience and now the death of a perfect sacrifice. Finished. There are two things I want to pick up this morning from this. I said lots of things we could say. Here are two for us this morning that I think if we, if we see these things, uh, my hope it'll, just, it'll make us marvel at, at the work of Jesus even more. The first is that Jesus' sacrifice was willing. His sacrifice was willing. Uh, in verse 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, now, this is not saying that Jesus uh, knows he's done for. This is saying Jesus knows he's done everything he came to do. There are a lot of, as we've been going through um, this little section, there are a lot of surprises going on here. But not once is Jesus ever surprised. There are a lot of people who think they're in control. But it's really only Jesus who, in the end, is calling the shots here. And so, sure, yep, there might be people with power. Uh, the soldiers, they think they've got power. Pilate thinks he's got power. Um, the religious leaders, yeah, sure, they've got a bit of power. But they don't have any ultimate authority. It's a bit like, as uh, G.K. Chesterton said, he said, if a rhinoceros was to enter this restaurant now, there is no denying he would have great power here. But I should be the first to rise and assure him that he had no authority whatsoever. I don't think I'd be the first one to stand up and say that to the rhino, but you know, you get, you get the point. Jesus here, okay, there's some power going around. But Jesus, he's the one with authority. Even right to the end. So in verse 30, it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now maybe we missed this here, but read carefully. He gave up his spirit. Nobody took it from him. No one here is forcing Jesus to do something that he doesn't want to do. He's not simply the uh, poor victim of political incompetence or religious envy or maybe just dumb luck or blind fate. No, he gave up his spirit. And you might remember back in chapter 10 of John's Gospel, we read in verses 17 and 18 in John 10, now Jesus said, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may, may take it up again. No one takes it from me, he said. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And that's what we see here. It's exactly what, what we see. He willingly gives up his life. Now, I might ask, well, so what? Uh, why does that matter that this is willing? It had to be willing, otherwise it wouldn't have been perfect obedience. Jesus' death had to be willing or it wouldn't have been perfect obedience. Uh, anyone who's seen footage this week, it's come up again in the news, footage of... Uh, Lydia Thorpe taking the oath 
before becoming a senator. So if you've seen that, um, if you've seen it, you'll know the difference between doing just doing something <laughs> and doing something willingly. Uh, she said the words mostly, but you can tell that she was all but willing. Or uh, anyone who's had any dealings with children knows the difference between uh, willing obedience and just you know getting the right thing done. Ask a child, uh, maybe they're sitting in front of the TV, and you say, okay, can you go tidy your bedroom? And they go off in a huff and kick along and stuff and say, mm, didn't want to watch TV anyway. They go tidy their room, but it's hardly perfect obedience. When you ask, please go tidy your room, and then they say, uh, your will is my command... Um, with passion and pleasure, I will carry out this task. Okay, that's good. It's like, um, what, did, what did Wesley say? What was Wesley's line to Princess Buttercup? As you wish, as you wish. Well, how much more when it comes to obedience to God? Jesus work on earth, his life right through to his death was defined by willing obedience to the Father. It's almost as if the Father's will and the Son's will are one, (laughs) as if they're somehow connected (laughs) in some way. And if we just scoot through a few different things, you know, in the temple to his parents, what does he say? Didn't you know that I that I'm here about my father's business. Back in John chapter 4, at the, at the well, uh, to his disciples, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. On the way to Jerusalem, uh, to Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God. In the upper room to Judas, says to him, what you're about to do, do quickly. The time has come. Let's get get on with it. In the garden to Peter, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? The scriptures must be fulfilled. In the garden to the Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. He says, if there's any other way, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then on the cross, perhaps just to himself. Not a cry of defeat, but a cry of victory finished. From start to end, the, the thing that, that drove him, his, his deepest desire was to fulfil his father's will. Uh, John Stott puts it like this. He says, When we talk of the father's plan and the son's sacrifice, we should not think of the father laying on the son an ordeal he was unwilling to bear, nor should we think of the son extracting from the father our salvation he was unwilling to bestow. Wait a second, sorry. <clears throat> Everyone just look over that way. <laughs> Nor should we think of the son extracting from the father a salvation he was unwilling to bestow. It is true that the father gave the son. It is equally true that the son gave himself. And so as R.C. Sproul said, uh, with nothing left to do, Jesus gave up his spirit. He had said, I lay down my own life that I may take it up again. When his mission was accomplished, when the atonement was complete, Jesus made the decision to die. When that happened, what happened? What happened when Jesus did that? The second thing I want to pick up this morning is that Jesus 
sacrifice was once for all. It was once for all. Uh, the Greek word, which is translated here, it is finished, is uh, tetelestai. And I know we try to avoid talking about the Greek and, and you know, that sort of stuff because inevitably, whenever the preacher mentions, oh, in the Greek, half a dozen people fall asleep straight away. Now, it's really amazing how that happens. So we try not to do that. But I'll, I'll mention now because tetelestai, it's just a nice word to say, uh, tetelestai. Um, oh, here we it's everyone, all together, let's, one, two, three. No, 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 <laughs> I can't believe you did that, actually. In uh, the world here, in the, in the Greek arena, especially in the, in the commercial world, this, this word, it was either written on a receipt or maybe stamped on a purchase order, and it meant paid in full. Paid in full. Jesus said, I've done it all. I've drunk the cup to the dregs. The sin debt of my people has been paid in full. So when Jesus says, and he says to Peter, shall I, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And then when he says, it is finished, he's not saying, I, I took a few sips and that was enough. He said, I, I drank it to the very last drop. The cup of God's wrath against all of God's people finished right to the end. Now, there are a lot of places in the New Testament that talks about you know, what was achieved here. And we go to lots of them. Just, it's worth, just turn to Hebrews chapter 10. If you've got your Bibles there open. And... Um, have a look at how the author of Hebrews, I think he's describing what, what is, is going on here. Jesus says, it is finished. And then in Hebrews, he, he fleshes out what that means. So Hebrews chapter 10. And it's worth noting, not one Old Testament priest was ever able to say, it is finished. Not one. Not once. So if you've got it there, Hebrews 10, verse 11, which says, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. That is, they were repeated again and again and again. An atonement that needs constant repetition cannot be said to atone. Imagine you go to the doctor and you're feeling unwell. And after examining you, the doctor says um, you've got a sore throat. Then he prescribes some antibiotics for you and says, take these for 10 days and then after 10 days um, you'll be well. And his prediction proves right. And even after a few days you start to feel better. When the course of antibiotics has finished, uh, you don't take it anymore. And the fact that you no longer take the medicine shows that it's worked. Someone else goes to the doctor feeling unwell and after examining them, the doctor says, I'm sorry, your condition is whatever it might be. And because of this, the doctor prescribes a particular medicine and he tells the patient, you will have to take this medicine for the rest of your life. In this case, the unending use of the medicine shows that the person will never be cured. And so it is in the Old Testament, the Old Testament sacrifices. The unending repetition <laughs> proved that they didn't actually heal. They didn't deal with sin. But, in contrast, verse 12, Hebrews 10, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. Why a single sacrifice? Because it was done. 
It was enough. It was finished. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, what happened? He sat down at the right hand of the Father. It's interesting to uh, note the furniture that was in the sanctuary where the priests carried out their, their functions. What, what was the furniture there in the tabernacle? Um, table, lamp stand, uh, an altar, Ark of the Covenant. That's it. No place, no place to sit down, no place to rest, no provision for the priest to sit at all, no chair, no bench, no stool, not even a beanbag. Why is that? Because the priests were ever to be working. It was never ending. Every priest stands daily at his service. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Even the angels don't sit in God's presence. A seated priest is the guarantee of a finished work and an accepted sacrifice. So, so when Jesus says, it is finished, he's not just talking about his own work and his life. He's really saying, all the Old Testament sacrificial system, it's all done. <laughs> Judaism, it's finished. Now, I don't think anybody here is going to be particularly tempted to go back to Judaism. But we might be tempted to keep trying to make our own little sacrifices here and there. To make ourselves more acceptable to God. Perhaps if I just sacrifice this or sacrifice that, perhaps if I just forego this or forego that, if I just... If I, if I do this deed or if I do that other thing, then maybe God will be more favor, favourably disposed towards me. Have you ever thought that? I've had a really good week <laughs> this past week. God must be really pleased with me. Or conversely, I've had a bad week. Maybe God's not happy with me. Well, the extent to which we do that is really the extent to which we have not understood the finished sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. If we can add just one thing to his sacrifice, then it's an insufficient sacrifice. It's not finished if there are things we can add to it, which even includes our faith. <laughs> Our faith is not something we add onto the work of Jesus. As if, well, he's done his bit and uh, it got most of the way or even 99% of the way and now it's over to you to add to that your, your belief and your repentance. We, we can't add anything to the work of Jesus. Our faith and our repentance are a result of Jesus' work. That he gives to us. Not something that he, he says, well, I've done my bit and now it's up to you. What was it that we just sang? Your works, not mine, O Christ. Others might say, well, in the Bible, doesn't it say that... Uh, we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Well, good, yes, it does say that. <laughs> and in fact, it also says things like you're to offer your lips as a sacrifice of praise. It says we should offer our gifts and so on. It, it does use that language. There are a number of things we're to offer as sacrifices, but none of them, not one of them, is in order to attract God's mercy. All of them are to be done as a result of God's mercy, an expression 
of what we have already received. Can't add anything to the work of Jesus. Jesus says it's finished. So let's not, let's not try to add things. If you try to add, you'll only just take away. One more thing uh, to pick up. If you've still got Hebrews 10 open, one more thing. It's, a just, it's such a lovely picture. Um, it's, it's worth including, I think. Uh, look back at verse 3. In, in Hebrews 10. It's talking about the old, the, old, the old Testament system. It says, But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Now, that, that's interesting, don't you think? <laughs> Not a removal of sins, which is what you might expect it to say, but it says there is a reminder of sins. It's almost as if the purpose of that whole system is just to point forward to something else. <laughs> and then in contrast to that, look at verse 16. It says, This is the covenant that I will make for them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, and this is just a remarkable addition. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Not just forgiven, but forgotten. Now, I know what you're thinking here. We might be thinking of the, uh, the song by the cause... Uh, you know, forgiven, not forgotten. Well, this is the other way around. Uh, forgiven and forgotten. But what you might also be thinking is, how can God forget things? How does that work? As Homer Simpson once said, God knows everything. He's omnivorous. <laughs> Let me put a, a, paint a picture for you. Imagine... Imagine you genuinely wrong someone. You've, you've wronged them in, in a real way. You apologise, and then they say to you, I forgive you. Well, that's nice. <laughs> then they quickly add, but I will never forget. Hmm, not so nice. <laughs> because either they mean, I don't really forgive you, or... What they mean is, well, I'll forgive you this time, but if you do it again, don't be so sure on my gracious attitude towards you. But what God says is that because of the completed, finished, once-for-all work of Jesus, you're forgiven even if you do it again. Because of what happened back here in John chapter 19. When Jesus says, it is finished. Completely forgiven for everything. So forgiven that it's almost as if God can say, it's forgotten. Because of this back here. And because of this work back here that was so, so powerful, so strong, so perfect, complete, Nothing we do here now in our, in our lives can upset it or undo it or change it. Forgiven sin is forgotten sin. As an act of his sovereign will, he refuses to entertain our experiences with sin. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, God will never bring up our sins as evidence against us. And so in verse 18 in, in Hebrews 10, the writer says, Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Tetelestai. It is finished. And so what does that mean for us? Heaps of things. 
But what about the times when your heart accuses you? And you ask yourself, maybe you're reflecting back on the week that's been, and you think, I wonder if I've loved people enough this week. And you have to write in the column next to it, no. I wonder if, I, if, if I've really read my Bible and prayed in such a way as to meet with God. No. I wonder if I've really been as generous as I should have been. No. I wonder if I've, if I've really seized the opportunities to pr- pr- promote the name of Jesus. Well, that's another no. What do you do at that point? Well, if you say to yourself, what I'm going to have to do now is make sure next week is even better, and so it sort of counterbalances the bad week that I've just had. If that's what you think to yourself, then you're really operating on the same basis as your diet. (laughs) Well, I've had far too many calories uh, last week, well, this week, I can sort of make up for it by cutting back on a few different things. Well, it doesn't work like that when it comes to our Christian lives. (laughs) But how many of us do operate like that? And if and when we do, it's because we haven't really understood that Jesus is our great high priest who has done everything. And so when, when Satan comes round to your house... And he says, look, it's all very well and good to be having these thoughts while you're at church, these nice thoughts about Jesus. But let's just think about this for a moment. I remember the time. I remember last week what you did. I remember that thing last year or five years ago or 15 years ago. I remember when you did this and when you did that. I remember that selfish agenda that you thought was hidden. I remember those sinful thoughts that, that you thought nobody knew about. Well, what do you do at that point? You say, get lost, Satan. You might remember, but God doesn't. This is the covenant that I will make with them, declares the Lord. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. So when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, what do I do? Do I look for signs of assurance in here somewhere, in my own actions? No, no. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. So how do I really know that my sins are forgiven? Well, because Jesus promised. (laughs) Because Jesus said, it is finished. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the work of Jesus. Uh, That work which was so perfect, so complete that it can't be added to in any way and and we ask for forgiveness when we try to do that and that work that was so perfect, so complete that nothing can be taken away from it and so we ask that you help us when we we do doubt. And Father, our prayer is that, that by your grace we may be able to rest and trust uh, not in who I am or what I can do, not in my works, Uh, but in the works of Jesus, but in what Jesus has done for me. And may it be that that our hearts do 
uh, do sing with, with gladness. Uh, to whom but thee, who can alone for sin atone? Nothing, no one uh, but the Lord Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, children and skids, kindergarten to year four. Please walk out and uh, meet your skids leaders in the foyer for your program this morning. of us, let's uh, stand and sing of the, the, the perfect, completed, finished work of the Lord Jesus. O to see the dawn.